Okay. All right, so what I'd like to do, I have Twitter up right now. I know probably 102% of you are familiar with this. I'm not very good at math, so check the numbers on that. But um, I had a question, and this goes to teachers, and it goes to parents, and it goes to anybody who's ever worked as a babysitter or has younger siblings or whoever. When you're trying to teach somebody something that they don't know, and you'll encounter this question as a teacher at least a few times a year, even if you're doing a great job of building things inside of context, they're going to ask you, when am I going to need to use this in my life? All right, so what I would like is for those of you out there who are teachers, and like I said, those other categories too, if you can, in 140 characters, summarize this young why people need to know what you're teaching them. Okay, how do you answer that question for them? You need to know this because blank, all right? And try and use the 140 EDU hashtag so we'll see it because it's, it's going to scroll up here. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a few, few seconds to, to think about that. Type out an answer social interaction with the hashtag. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was the question. Um, can, when kids ask you, why do I need to use this? When am I ever going to use this? Why do I need to know this? Why do you know? How am I going to use this in my life? Those those questions that come up. Um, I know in calculus, I heard that a lot. When am I ever going to use calculus in real life? Or um, why do I need to know what a predicate is? Or you know. Who, who cares where Angola is on a map, right? Um, you get those kind of questions. When am I going to need to use this in real life? Let's see if we can get a refresh on that one. All right. So we're going a little slow. I hear typing, though, which is good. Um, the point I'm trying to make, though, and you'll, you'll put your answers up there and we'll get to see them. The point I'm trying to make about the, the micro-intern program is that this program answers that question without me having to say anything, all right? Because what I do is I take kids and I put them in the actual environment where they need to know this stuff and let them work with it. It's not just a show. It's not just a field trip. It's, it's them working with these people, using these technologies, using these skills, and they get to see it in real time, see people who are building businesses, and it answers the question without me having to say anything. Okay? So I'm going to give you a little background. Hopefully some of the answers will come up here. I'm going to give you a little background on what the micro-intern program is. It's me matching kids with New York tech startups for one-day internships. Now, the kids that I work with, as Jeff said, seventh grade, um, eighth graders as well, and then um, to, in this summer we had some sixth graders who, because they were becoming seventh graders. I let them in the program too. I wouldn't necessarily try this with grades younger than that, but sixth, seventh, eighth graders I think can handle it. So in February, we went to Techstars, which is a New York, uh, it's, well, it was in New York, but it's actually all over America, but they're an incubator for startups, for tech startup companies and they select 10 companies or so out of thousands of applicants, and these companies stay with Techstars for three months, and they get to build their product and meet with investors and learn how to craft the perfect pitch and, and get together with other developers that can help expand their business and, and they, you know, learn about market research and user experience and all these things, and they can kind of get together and brainstorm. So what I did was I got my kids involved with that. So we had 10 kids for 10 companies, so each kid got to embed with a different company for the day. And like I said, it's not a field trip where they're just kind of standing there and, and watching, okay? They're supposed to be doing stuff. So they're sitting down, they're, they're dealing with customers. One of the companies was trying to come up with a new name for their product because they wanted to expand what the, you know, the users were for their product. So they wanted to redesign the name because they felt the name pigeonholed them too much. So one of my kids was on Twitter all day talking with the community, trying to find alternative names that fit what they were actually trying to do better than the name they had. Um, so he got to understand branding. That's one example of the, you know, the dozens or, or hundreds of little kind of mini lessons they learned. And um, in April, we went to Yodel, okay, which is an internet marketing company. The whole time they're there, they're uh, making videos, they're tweeting. They're writing blog posts for the company, for their own blogs, and they're engaging in all these kind of, you know, ambient learning activities that go on. And 
part of the reason I think these kind of programs are important to get your kids out of the classroom and to show them, not just tell them, but to show them when they're going to use this stuff in real life and why it's important to learn this stuff. And I think, um, you know, some of the other presenters um, today talk about, you know, kids following, you know, their own passions and self-directed learning and trying to make things relevant for them. And I agree with that on some level, but another side of me says that we don't want 12-year-olds to necessarily flesh out the passions they have at age 12. What we want to do is ex expand their horizons and broaden their life so that they can find other passions later on that will become bigger and better and lifelong pursuits. I know when I was 12, I was more interested in, you know, kind of riding my bike and, you know, smashing glass bottles up against the school after hours and, um, you know, destroying property and things, you know, those kind of fun things. But it wasn't until later on in life where I got to learn more about what the world has to offer me. And I could see, wow, hey, that's fascinating. Hey, that's interesting. And that's, that's kind of the idea, is to get these kids to see that there's a broader horizon out there. And part, you know, part of creating that, that rich environment is about making things memorable for the kids. And if you can make things memorable, they stick, right? So what I'd like to do, I'd like to add, um, there's some great, some great stuff up there now. What I'd like to do is, is kind of add a little bit more if we can. I'd like you to tweet, think about it for a moment, but if you can tweet with the 140 EDU hashtag, what is your greatest moment in your entire life? Okay, think about it for a minute. Think about what was the most emotionally powerful, most amazing moment of your life. And I'm not gonna coach you up on it because I think you all probably have one already, so um, if you could think about it and tweet it out so we can see. Can we get a refresh? We're a little low. Real time, right? Birth of my daughter, Dr. Green. Okay. That's a great one. Anybody else want to throw one up there? Can we refresh it again back there? All right, all right, we're a little, there we go, real-time web. Being the unexpected winner of a Pro Beach Volleyball Tournament at 5-3, that's pretty impressive. Sitting next to me, my daughter, she'll be speaking tomorrow, okay? So now think about these things, right? Unexpected winner of a Beach Volleyball Tournament the day my daughter was born, okay? Th these types of things, the reason why they stick in your mind is because they're emotionally powerful events. They happen to you one time, right? Having a child happens to you one time. Um, you know, winning that beach volleyball tournament as a surprise is something that happens to you one time. It's an emotionally powerful event, but that memory will stick with you for a lifetime, all right? And I always um, kind of of the theory that when it comes to school and our purpose, that the word learning kind of covers too broad of a, of a spectrum. And I kind of limit it to just retention, right? If you don't remember what you learned, you didn't really learn it, okay? And I don't know what the word is to describe that, whether it's exposure or whatever, but the, the, the language doesn't necessarily matter. It's the concept that I'm trying to get across, that if I teach you something and moments later you don't know what I'm talking about, you can't apply it in any situation, everybody agrees you didn't learn it, okay? If I teach you something and that night you go home and you can apply it, and you can use it in different contexts, okay? You might say you learned it, but then down the road, if I ask you a, a year or two later, do you know how to do this and you don't know how to do it, what's that called? I don't know, I don't call it learning. Um, temporary learning, I don't know what the word is, but riding a bike is an example. I haven't ridden a bike in probably three years, but I can hop on a bike right now and ride with no problem because I know how to do it, I learned how to do it, okay? So what I'd like to, to impress upon you is these two different paths to creating memories. The emotional, powerful event that happens to you and the other type of event. Now, I'd like to see, see if, we can, if we can do this quickly, but can you tweet out with the 140 EDU hashtag the exact moment that you remember learning English? I'm hearing giggling. 
I'm hearing giggling. I'm guessing we're not going to get any good answers for that one. Anybody? All right, so my guess is we're probably not going to have a single tweet up there about that because the reason why you don't remember the exact moment is because there was no exact moment. It was something you learned over time through deliberate, distributed practice from the moment you were born and started hearing people speak to now, okay? When you're out in the hallway and you're talking and you're, you might learn new vocabulary words, you might, your grammar might improve, but you don't learn English at any one moment. Okay? And most of the things that we learned, we don't learn at any one moment. We have two kinds of memories, the emotional and the kind that comes over time with practice. And part of, part of the beauty of these kind of programs where you can bring kids out into the real world and show them these things is that you can take advantage of both of those things. You can create emotionally powerful events for them where they get to see things that will stick with them for years to come but it also acts as a fuel. That emotion acts as a fuel for the other kind of learning, which, like I said, is the majority of what we do. It's through deliberate, distributed practice over time. So using that emotion to inspire kids, to motivate kids, whatever words you want to use, using that emotion will get you the other kind. And if you can take advantage of emotion and let kids practice at what they're doing, you have greatly increased your chances of having them actually learn something, in my definition of learning, which is retention. Okay, so um, I'm going to wrap it up in a minute, but I would like to throw out one more question if we can get it up there. Um, can you think, if you're a teacher or a parent or whoever, think about a place that you can get your kids to that will create those emotionally powerful events that will inspire them to follow up with the practice afterwards. What kind of places, depending on your subject, whether you're an English teacher, okay, you might say, well, I could bring them to the library. Maybe that's not as good as bringing them to an author's house, right? And in this day and age of the real-time web, we can connect with anybody, and you'll be shocked at how many people are willing to work with you, all right? I get an idea in my head, I tweet it, I find a person's email, I ask them, and I don't know what the success rate is, but it's extraordinarily high for what I would expect. People are very generous with their time, especially with kids. So I, I highly recommend seeking out these opportunities for your kids for the two reasons I mentioned, the emotionally powerful and the practice through repetition. That's all for me. Thank you very much.